Yeah. Okay. So we have um, we have a good amount of people. Do you want to start? Sure. All right. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are are Google Plus or YouTube viewers. If you are Google Plus, you can ask questions. Um, there's a Q&A button, and feel free to ask questions, and we'll we'll answer them as we can. Um, as you guys know, hopefully, Three Principles Global Community is a nonprofit organization committed to bringing an understanding of the principles to people throughout the world. Our mission is to increase the number of people who are teaching, sharing, and learning the principles and enhance and facilitate professional collaboration in this field. Uh, my name is Vanessa. Um, maybe those of you, uh, wait, the link you just sent is working. OK, great. Um, thank you, Jen. Um, I'm Mara Gleason's sister-in-law. I also uh, she she owns and runs One Thought and is one of the founders of 3PGC, and um, I also work with One Thought and handle Three Principles administrative work. Um, I'm here today with Dr. Pettit, and I'm going to read a little bit about him. His name is Dr. Will F. Pettit Jr. M.D. Um, he is co-owner with his wife, Linda, of Three Principles Intervention, LLC. Dr. Petta has presented the three universal principles of mind, consciousness, and thought as the essence of his psychiatric practice since 1983. A graduate of Creighton University, Omaha, and the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago, Dr. Petta completed his psychiatric residency at the Philadelphia Naval Regional Medical Center. He is board certified in psychiatry, adolescent psychiatry, geriatric psychiatry, and psychosomatic medicine. He is also certified in addiction medicine. Presently, he holds an appointment as adjunct professor in the Graduate College of Siena Heights University. Formerly, he held an appointment as associate professor of behavioral medicine and psychiatry at West Virginia University, and was the med medical director of the Sydney Banks Institute at WVU. Um, and the list goes on. You are, you are more than qualified to be talking at the moment. I was going to say, do I have any time left? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. And to uh, talk is about wisdom. I'm really looking forward to it. Shall I go ahead? Please. Yeah. I always have this fear. What if I freeze up and I don't know what to say? And people have assured me that that's not going to happen. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> well, when I really was preparing for this um, presentation today, you know, um, uh, wisdom is what really came to mind. But as I as I prepared for it, and even this morning, um, and by just getting as quiet as I could and getting a good rest last night, and different things have come that I'm going to share, kind of, if you will, five or six points. Uh, they say never, maybe never have more than uh, five, so maybe I can scrunch two of them together or something. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I feel sometimes, you know, having done this for 32 years, I feel a little bit like Sid when he used to talk. Not that I talk at the level that Sid did, but, but I, I have been doing this a while, and at my level, I think, you know, I feel like an old record in my, you know, like people that have listened to me is like, like, uh, you know, what about what do I have to say that I haven't already said? So I don't know that there'll be anything new, but but to me it's always evolving. And what I saw this morning was, um, I, and I'm going to mention these five things that I'm going to touch on that that um, I'm going to go into. Number one, as many of you have heard me say, there's one basic mental illness and that's chronic mental stress. Sid, Sid said that. He said there you may say that there's and I'd, I'd usually have his quotes from beside me I don't have the exact quote but that there's one generic mental and that's not understanding the role of thought. Well my paraphrase on that would be that chronic mental stress is the only uh, source of everything that's in the 900 page DSM-5 um, and that that's the problem and and that unconditional love is the answer 
and Sid says that over and over. Love and understanding, love and compassion is the answer. So how do you get there, you know? And we talk about uh, these understanding the nature of these three principles. And so I think if I were to list the insights to varying degrees that have evolved, w one is to, to see the nature of being human that, that Elsie and Chip talk about so fluently and, and the rest of us as best as we can, that our true nature is that of divine energy, that we're whatever you, if you don't like that word divine, uh, whatever that energy was before the Big Bang, uh, that, we, that we are made of that energy and that we're, we've taken form and that has incredible implications because it means that we have access to divine wisdom 24-7 uh, and uh, not just certain work hours each day but 24-7 wisdom is available to us. And, and that correlates with the second thing is if, if chronic mental stress is the, is the problem and, and unconditional love is the answer, the, another thing that I saw that Sid said repeatedly, but I, then I, when I saw it, it made a difference. And I think this is something that, well, well, we'll go further, that as I see people, that people don't see this, but that the brain is a computer, the mind is is our connection to the divine you know um, you could put a brain in a box you'll never see anybody with a box walking around with my a mind in in the box because the mind is formless right it's formless and it's it's really another way of talking about that intimate connection with divine energy that that we're we're not the ocean but we certainly are of the same substance as the ocean and saying you're a drop in the ocean is not the same as saying you're the ocean. Huh? So, so the second thing then is that the the mind is is spiritual. It's formless. It's the connection to the divine, and and the brain is is a computer. And uh, as a computer, it's very predictable. Uh, in in any time that we have uh, uncertainty in our life, the brain is going to spit out worries. And uh, it, it's going to give us every powerful, uh, every every potential thing that could go wrong. And so you'll hear, um, "What if this happens? What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? What if?" And our, and I've many of people have heard me say that the what ifs will multiply in your brain much faster than any two rabbits will ever multiply. So if you leave ten ra two rabbits alone for ten minutes. There may be something started, but there's only going to be two rabbits walking around. But if you put two what ifs in your head and you let give them a lot of attention, they will create hundreds of little what ifs within ten minutes. True, Vanessa? Would you say? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now the other thing, the third thing that I came to see that's been really important to me is that the default setting is love and lightheartedness. You know, I grew up as a mental illness professional, not not as a I was trained as a mental illness professional, not as a mental health professional. And in the view of the mental illness system, which we misnomer called the mental health system, um, mental health is something you have to dig through the rubble to try to find uh, some resemblance of and um, instead of that it is the default setting it's what's at our essence as human beings and um, the metaphors that I often use is is that it's like being on the surface of the water with a life vest or I sometimes my metaphors are less than than uh, high high uh, intellect I I say it's like we have cork in our butt we are meant to be on the surface, you know. Now, if we have cork in our butt or if we have a life vest on, you could put enough weights on somebody, even with a life vest, that would pull them under the water. And that's what we innocently do when we give attention to low mood thinking. We innocently take ourselves down. And, and when we're under the water, five feet with a three-foot snorkel, 
it's not a good idea to take a deep breath and it's not a good idea mentally to pay attention to our thinking until we're back to the surface and that was a big one for me to realize that when I had lost my right mind as my good friend Beverly Wilson she used to say you know Dr. Pettit it's not rocket science sometimes you're in your right mind and sometimes you're not in your right mind and when you're not in your right mind it's time to leave your thinking alone zip your mouth sit on your hands until you get back to your right mind do as little damage as possible and she spoke very eloquently to the fact that the default setting for all of us is a place of of being in our right mind that is a place of love and lightheartedness love and lightheartedness you know and uh, my friend George Pransky, uh, he used to say seriousness was the most underdiagnosed mental illness that there is. You know, and a lot of people go, wait a minute, I think it's important to be serious, right? You can't be responsible if you're not serious. Well, I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of serious person, people who weren't very responsible. And for myself, I noticed whenever I get serious about life, um, I lose compassion for myself. I lose compassion for others. Uh, I lose my sense of humor. I lose that direct access to that wisdom beyond the intellect. And life gets rather hard. Um, my late wife, uh, Sue, used to say, moment to moment, I'm either in my thoughts or I'm in my life. And one is very lighthearted and joyful, and the other is rather stressful. And I love Sid's, Sid's quote where he says that stress and distress is to mental illness as damp and dark is to fungus. Right? It really helps it grow, right? And he said, on the other hand, love and lightheartedness is to mental health as, or, or is to mental illness as sunlight and dry is to fungus. It eradicates it. It, it instead takes us back home to that place of love and wisdom um, that we're, our default setting is. Now, the other thing that has come to me, to me as a, and these to me are like corollaries. To me, as you, as you understand the, the three principles of universal mind, universal thought, universal consciousness, deeper and deeper, and you come to a realization that we are, we are those principles in form, uh, and that we've taken on a form, and that we're using those principles to go through life, then, then uh, there are corollaries. It's like some people have heard me say before that it's like in geometry. I think everybody remembers fondly how much fun geometry was. Some not so, right? Uh, but like the, the Pythagorean theorem, which most of us remember, was the square of the hypotenuse in a right-sided triangle, or 90 degree, a triangle with a 90 degree angle. The, Square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the two sides, of the square of the two sides. Well, after it has a theorem in geometry, it will then have like, like a whole bunch of corollaries, maybe 12, 15 corollaries, which are obvious truths that come from that one fact, uh, that fact of the, of the theorem. And to me, that's what a lot of these things that I'm talking about today there are obvious corollaries from uh, from seeing the the principles deeper and deeper, and one of the corollaries that I think I've seen a lot of people have trouble with is the corollary of what I'll call psychological innocence. And Sid used to talk about this um, uh, that people were always every moment of their life, given their level of understanding and their feeling level that they're bringing to that level of understanding or the level of understanding that they're bringing to the feeling level that they're in they are every moment of their life making 
what to them at that moment was the best choice that they saw to make. That's profound. And it has implications. A lot of people, it's, it's uneasy for them to think about psychological innocence because they want somebody, they want some people to be labeled as evil. And there is no doubt that people do things that we label as evil acts, that they do things that are incredibly hurtful to innocent people or to non-innocent people. They do things that are very hurtful. But I, I'm going to be uh, on record as a backer of psychological innocence. And I think that many of us ourselves can look at back at things that we did, and now we can be very in exquisite judgment of them and it would take uh, somebody or, or maybe not even with a gun to our head would we do what we did but at the time it made sense and uh, and I think that's important to see psychological innocence because why because it allows people to forgive themselves and to forgive other people and certainly the chapter in, in the missing link on Love and Forgiveness, to me, is one of the most powerful chapters in a very powerful book, where Sid says, you know, without, without forgiveness, you will never find peace of mind. You will live in doubt and misery. Now, we may say that's just not fair. I don't think that's fair. Well, it's like gravity, you know. It may not be fair that if we're on the third floor of a hotel, that we have to take the elevator or the stairs and can't just go out the window uh, to the ground. But it's a fact. If you do that, you're likely to have at least a couple of broken legs at best, right? It's just understanding gravity. It's understanding the principles. And, and what allows me, I know for me, I went through life. I saw a young woman this morning that was having about 10 hissy fits a day. Uh, anger outburst, yelling and screaming at people, and and I and I told her, I said, you know, there was a time in my life when I had about ten hissy fits a day, and I always thought it was being caused by people out by people outside of me. I didn't realize that I had the hissy fit machine machine inside of me, and then whenever people didn't do what I wanted them to do or did things I didn't want them to do, I activated the hissy the hissy fit machine, right? So, so, but but I can look back with innocence on my hissy fits now because I didn't know any better. And as as I've shared with many, I literally went in and out of clinical depression from probably age 17 to 41 until April Fool's Day, 1983, when I met Sydney Banks. That's just the way it was. And what did I think? I thought it was in my genes. I thought it was because my mom was depressed. My grandfather, father, after a tragedy in the family, had taken his life. And my mother struggled with depression and troubles, struggled with alcohol. So I thought it was in my genes and uh, to be depressed. And I had no awareness that the fact that I was spending six to nine hours a day in worry, guilt, Resentment, overanalyzing, unresolved grief, upset. I always tell people I used to spend about 40% of every day in the past with the Uda sisters. Some A woman said, why don't you call them the Uda brothers? <laughs> That's not fair. I said, well, okay, the Uda persons. Right? Shoulda, woulda, and coulda. All this shoulda, woulda, and coulda. And their cousins might have been and was gonna. And I, I would spend every 40% of every day in the past with regrets and, and guilt. And then I spent another 40% of every day in the future with the what ifs, worrying about what was going to happen next. And then the 20% of the day that I was in the future, I mean that I was in the present, because everybody said the present is so great, I found a way to screw that up. I spent my 20% that I was in the present being upset about things that weren't the way I wanted them to be. So, needless to say, uh, brilliant that I was, that I hadn't figured out why I was depressed, right? It was amazing, amazing. 
and it's so innocent. It's so innocent. And, and of course, as I learn the neurochemistry and learn the neuroscience, when you see what happens with constant activation of the stress response, the fight or flight response that was made to be activated maybe once every 48 to 72 hours for a maximum of 30 minutes. It was made so that our ancestors had a chance with nothing but a club against a saber-toothed tiger or wild wolves, right? It was important that you be able to raise your blood sugar and, put, and, and, and get massive amounts of noradrenaline and epinephrine and all this stuff and shut down your sex hormones because if you're going to get die, you're not going to need sex. And, you shut down your immune system because you don't have to worry about infection if you're going to get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. So it's okay for those 30 minutes to shut down growth hormone, not worrying about growing if you're not, if you're not going to be alive, right? So that's okay to shut down for 30 minutes. It's not, however, okay to shut it down for 24-7 for days and weeks and months. Like so often we innocently do, worrying about things that we would say, I'm really justified in worrying, doctor. I'm worrying about my mom's breast cancer. I'm worrying about my dad's alcoholism. I'm worrying about my brother's cocaine habit. I'm really worrying about my grandchild that's got Down syndrome. I'm worrying. And I say, well, how's it working? Have you noticed what happens with, to your state of mind as you do this? And that's where, of course, wisdom comes in, that people worry because they think the only thing they have to go back on is analysis, is somehow figuring out some solution from analytical thinking. And uh, I love the quote, many of you have heard me say many times, the quote from Einstein, where here's the greatest scientist since Newton, and he said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The analytical mind, its faithful servant. Wow. Now, when he's talking about the intuitive mind, I believe he's talking about that place of wisdom. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift the analytical mind, its faithful servant. However, we have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Now, I don't know that Einstein saw clearly the three principles, but I know that he saw, he saw a lot because he knew when he got stuck in his formulas and I don't know if he knew to what degree in his personal life, but when he knew to get, when he got stuck, at least in his work, he knew it was time to leave it alone and take a walk or go sailing or play his violin or, or ride on his swing until his mind quieted and he would see beyond where he was stuck and go forward again. So... The last thing that I had on my list is I'd listen to people and I see people that I think and, and I think for myself was one of the greatest in gifts of an insight is that we do have a free will regarding which thoughts we give attention to. And Sid used to always say that. He says that in The Missing Link, you know, that we were given this incredible power and gift of thought, and that with it, we were given a free will. So we literally could choose which thoughts we gave attention to. That's powerful. And I did not know that. Nobody in 26, you'd think if somebody had been to school for 26 and a half years, 
that somebody one day would say, oh, by the way, you know, this thing that you do all day long called thinking, you've also got a free will. I mean, it wouldn't have been too much for him to add that, right? It didn't take that long. You know, it would have at least piqued my interest. I might not have seen what they were saying, but they could have at least put it out there into the universe that there was a thing called free will, that I was not at the mercy of every thought that my brain spit out, my computer brain. My late wife, uh, well, no, in fact, my present wife was wonderful. Uh, I, I prob we probably both, with, but Linda, Linda and I, my present wife, Linda, who is a wonderful teacher of the principles and says them with such clarity that when we speak together, even though I've been doing this for 32 years and she has about 10 years experience, I have her talk about the principles because every time she does it, she does it with such clarity and she does can talk about the spiritual in a way that doesn't nobody gets their hair up. It just it, they go, oh yeah, that makes sense, you know. So it's wonderful. But she and I were at one of the three principles conferences and there's a man and I used to know his name. I think his first name is John. And he he Mavis Carn, a wonderful lady in Minneapolis was working in the prison in the Minneapolis area. He said something like, you know, I've been in prison 22 out of the last 26 years. I've been out for short periods of time, but not for very long. Because then I do something and I got in. But when Miss Karn was lecturing at our course on these three principles in the prison, she said something that I've never heard before. She said, just because you have a criminal thought doesn't mean you have to act on it. Well, he said, you know, that, that may sound really silly to you, but that was an eye-opener to me. I didn't know that I could have a criminal thought and and ignore it. Now, for many of you that are out there listening, you probably had the same response that I did, and, and Linda speaks very eloquently of it. She said, the first time I heard that, I said, well, that's kind of silly. That's kind of silly. I have criminal thoughts on occasion, but I know that I don't have to act on them. I mean, you know, who doesn't know that? Right? Well, John hadn't known that, and he paid a heavy price. But then Linda said, I got some humility. And, and, and of course, I wish he was here telling the story when you tell other people's story. But I think it was true for me, too. I could tell it my own that she said, you know, I suddenly said, wait a minute, Linda. You're up on your high and mighty chair. Do you know that you can have an anxious thought? and not be anxious. Mm -hmm. Did you know that you could have a judgmental thought and not be judgmental? Just have a passing thought? Did you know that you could have an angry thought and not be angry? And she said, that's what I first started to see and I did, I too, that I have a free will that I cannot, don't have control over every thought that gets triggered from my computer brain. They can be triggered by people that look like people. Like, let's just say, let's just say, uh, Vanessa, that, that as you got on today, that you were a spit, and I haven't lost a sister in an accident, I have lost family members in motor vehicle accidents, but not a sister, but let's say when you came on today, you were a spitting image of a sister that had gotten killed in an auto accident when she was 20 or 25. I could have immediately had my felt my gut, felt tears in my eyes, and not even known what was going on for a few seconds until I realized, oh my gosh, Vanessa is a spitting image of, of Martha or Mary or or what my sister and and that happens we are always having thoughts triggered from the environment 
And one of the ways that I've shared sometimes, my late wife and I uh, were out at a, a sushi bar in San Diego one time, and it was a big oval-shaped room. And the people in the center were making the plates of food, and they were putting them on a conveyor belt. And then as we sat on these high chairs, the, like, kind of like bar stools, whenever I was talking, giving lectures in a in a, a dual diagnosis or a chemical dependency, I'd say, well, I'm trying to find some other name to call them than bar stools, but they were like bar stools. <laughs> so, so you're sitting on these bar stools, and this food is coming by on pl platters, on plates uh, that people have made. And as they as they come by rather slowly, you have time to see if it's something that you think you might like. And if it looks kind of tasty, you take the plate and you have it in front of you and eat the plate, eat with the food that's on the plate. And they charge you for the plate. And I woke up one morning years later when I was studying the principles and I said, my gosh, that's like my thinking. It's like my thinking. Stuff comes by my, on the screen of my mind that I didn't have any control over manufacturing that I know of, at least I'm conscious of. It's just gotten triggered by something in the environment. And I can't control that. I can't control those thoughts. But coming into my, on the screen of my mind, but just like that food, I realized I have 100% free will control of which thoughts I chew on. Which thoughts I give attention to. You know, I have people, I had people come in my, to the psychiatrist, they say, man, all this stuff, and they list all these things, man, it's all just eating on me. It's eating on me, you know? And I say, Joe, listen now, this may be kind of hard for you to hear, but you got to take some responsibility on who's doing the eat, because I don't think these thoughts are eating on you. I think you've been a lot done doing a lot of chewing and eating on these thoughts. Right? <laughs> and I think that at the beginning, it's innocent because if you don't see the free will, it does seem like they're somehow eating on you and chewing on you until you see, wait a minute, I'm doing the chewing. I'm, the, I'm doing the eating. In fact, I saw a silly cartoon in one of my psychiatric news one time. There's a guy's lying on the couch, and the psychiatrist is sitting at the end like a good Freudian psychiatrist. And the guy's saying, you know, I just feel like there's just something eating on me. And there's this monster who's got his head inside his mouth. <laughs> I just have this feeling that something is... Anyway, it's kind of funny. But, <laughs> but I think that free will... To see that is a corollary of seeing the principles in action to truly, the day that people see that they are not at the mercy of their thinking. There's a freedom that comes to that, like that it, it makes you want to say, sing the hallelujah chorus, I think, you know. And some people do. <laughs> they say, they, they, we used to call this uh, years ago. Uh, back in the 80s, sometimes people would call this flathead therapy because when people would see it, they'd go, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> As they hit themselves in the forehead, they get a little flatter head every time. But when we see that we have a free will, that we don't have to, because if we don't, if we don't have a free will, then our thinking is a problem. And for, sadly, for a lot of people, their thinking is a problem. They will think, Dan, would you hand me that little green book on the bottom? They will think that they have to do something with their thinking. And as my friend George Pransky, who's, who's, who's got a wonderful sense of humor, he says, if you think you have to do something with your thinking, you better quit your day job. Because <laughs> you're not going to have any time or energy left to, to do anything else because we're thinking 24-7. And people say, God, I wish I could just stop thinking. 
And I say, well, you know what they do when you stop thinking? They turn the machine off. You know, you don't want that. You know, so it's not about learning to stop thinking. It's learning to have thoughts slow down, and they slow down naturally as you give them less attention. It's almost as if giving attention to your thinking, I never thought of this until this moment, but it's almost like somehow that pushes on the governor and, and, and the accelerator and speeds up your thinking. And you'll hear people say, I try so hard to slow down my thinking. And of course, they're trying to slow down their thinking with their thinking that's going very fast. <laughs> And one of my favorite quotes uh, is, that many of you have heard me do many times happens to be, I even know the page, page 106 in the missing link, because I use this so many times in group therapy. And what it says is, well, here's, here's what I read when I'm in the group, because I always make sure that I read this page. I say, I got, I got this page, guys. So here's what I read. If your thoughts wander onto a negative and rocky path, Fight them like hell. Distract yourself in any way you can. Try really, really hard to think positive thoughts. And of course, the other members of the group, when I look up, they go, well, what? I say, what's wrong? And they say, well, that's not what our book says. And I say, oh, I must have an old version of The Missing Link or whatever. What does your book say? And of course, they read what's there, which is, if your thoughts wander onto a negative and rocky path, don't take them too seriously. And I go, man, that sounds a lot easier than what I, my book says. Now, the funny thing about that, Vanessa, is that what I described was what I had done till I was 41 years old, till I met Mr. Banks. When I had thoughts that were, whether they were violent thoughts or inappropriate sexual thoughts or you name it, that I would have been taught you shouldn't have those kinds of thoughts, I would do my best to try to distract myself, get them out of my head, think positive thoughts. And, of course, all it did was to make those thoughts bigger because no thought can leave your mind when you're given an attention. Uh, it's like you've got a hold of the thought saying, get out of my face. It can't leave. Um, I often say that upsetting, unwanted upsetting thoughts are like uh, re unwanted relatives that come to visit. If you don't feed them, they will leave. Right? They will leave. And the way you feed upsetting thoughts is by giving them attention either by stewing on them or by fighting them, either one, either one. In fact, to take this to the extreme, I, I say if a, per, if a person came to me and they said, Dr. Pettit, I, I, don't, I don't have my cell phone, I don't have a pad of paper, I, I've got to find some way to remember something three hours from now. Now, this is made up because of technology now, but... And, and they say, well, I just, is there, any, is there any way you can guarantee that I will not forget this three hours from now? And I say, yeah, absolutely. I can give you a foolproof, foolproof, foolproof method. You will not forget what you, what you need to remember. And they say, well, what's the method? I say, for the next three hours, I want you as hard as you can to try to get it out of your mind. To try not to think about it. Because if a person tried not to think about a big blue whale for the next three hours, what would they be thinking about for the next three hours? A big blue whale, right? It didn't matter. And, and I think to start to see that we have a free will with, as regards our thinking, you know, that it's one of the reasons that a lot of people can't retire because they, they can't stay alone, be alone with their thinking any more than they, they want to find some way to people will say, well, I'm okay as long as I'm busy. they got to keep themselves busy and distracted because, why? Because they can't be alone with their thinking. Because they don't know 
to summarize here and then take questions. They don't know that they have a free will. They don't know that uh, that they can, uh, if they don't give attention to low mood thinking or to any thought that's going to take them away from peace of mind, that they will the default they'll go back to the default setting of mental well-being and access to wisdom. And uh, so anyway, in some ways I haven't talked specifically about universal mind, universal thought, and universal consciousness, but but I have. You know, mind is the power source that the that intelligent energy of all things um, that most people of faith would call God. And the reason God they used to say as a kid, God is everywhere, because everything in the universe is made up of the energy of mind whatever that energy was that was before the Big Bang is at the source and intimately connected to everything that has form in the universe. Sid used to call it the isness. You had the great nothingness, then you had the isness, and the great nothingness and the isness together are the allness. And I'd say, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> but I see it to some degree now. Um, so, and they were used in the power of thought, which indeed is the missing link between the formless and the form because the power of thought has no form but whenever we th use it to create a thought it now has form that can be measured electrically it can be measured neurophysically chemically all kinds of things so thought is the missing link between that world of the formless and the world of form and then consciousness is that gift that we have that gift that allows everything that we think to look real to us and if we don't know to take a look at our feeling level people say well how do I know which which pictures I make to which ones to trust and I say you know check your feeling level if you're in a lighthearted joyful feeling you can trust what you see if you're in an angry scared frightened envious you name it you're gonna. Have, I wouldn't trust what I see until I get back home, to a to a beautiful feeling. So, I'm aware of the time, and I'm aware, Vanessa, that there may be some questions. So, would this be a a place to stop for a minute, and see if there are? Yeah, that was lovely, by the way. Thank you. And it was. I thought the teleprompter wasn't going to work a couple of times. It got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, I'm not going to know what to say. But then the teleprompter got started back up again. Yeah, can you show us the book that you're reading this out of? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, no, it's a great time. We have about 15 minutes left, and we have quite a quite a large group of viewers right now. Um, and I encourage those of you who are on Google Plus to ask questions by typing in the Q and A box. Um, so go for it. Have a have a think about it, and then. You know, can answer some of them. Are we? We're waiting for questions right now. Yeah, we are. There, there was a comment which I okay. thought was interesting <laughs> when you were talking. Um, hopefully, hopefully, you don't mind, Denise. And I'm going to read this, but um, she said this explains why my blood pressure was up in the doctor's office, and when I take it at home, <laughs> um, it's much lower because mm -hmm. she'd worked. They call it the white. The white coat effect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have a question. Yeah. But you ahead. have one? Yeah. Question on addiction. Okay. 12 steps says, 12 steps, the 12 step program says there are two parts of addiction physical allergy, crave more once you start, right? And then mental obsession and that thinking that makes you start in the first place. So I'm not sure what the question is. Maybe it's. You're thinking about that. So say, can you say that physical allergy? Right. So there's and, the twelve step program says there's two parts of addiction: the physical allergy, where you crave more once you start, and the mental okay. obsession, where your thinking is what makes you start in the first place. Okay. So kind of to comment on that. Perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Well, he, I'm going to do it by kind of giving a different way of looking at addiction for this person. I've just asked them to not, as Sid, Sid often says, you know, Sid says, don't take on my beliefs. 
He said that repeatedly. You know, so I used to laugh when people would worry about it being a cult because the first thing Sid would ever say is, don't take on my belief. As soon as you take on a belief of mine, you've become a follower. Don't ever become a follower. Now, you can listen, and then if you have an insight while you're listening from within you, now it's yours, right? Now, now that's yours. You're seeing it, not because somebody else sees it. So I'm going to just share the way that I see addiction and having been certified in addictions twice, both in 1988 and 2004. The way I see it is that addiction, like all the other, and I would put addiction to drugs and alcohol over here on the right-hand side, and I would also put gambling, and I would also would put the, la the lady that walked in my office that weighed 455 pounds. I would also put the lady that does hoarding. I would also put people that do, the young adolescent girl that does cutting. I would also do the person that goes out shopping and spends hundreds of dollars and doesn't have the money to do so. I would also the person that has indiscriminate sex in a dangerous way or or in a way that uh, is in, in, uh, incurring on other people's uh, 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 rights or even taking advantage of smaller children. I would put uh, aggressive outbursts. I would put all of these things under what I will call solutions. And it's funny because in psychiatry, we name we would say to this person that has an alcohol addiction, we say, you have an alcohol problem. And to this lady that weighs 455 pounds, we'd say, you have a food problem. And to the person that's gambling and to the person that's cutting, we'd say, you have a cutting problem. And you have a shopping problem. You have a, a, a okay. And I'm suggesting to you that that's just not the case. That when people get caught up in chronic mental stress, three things happen on a very reliable basis. Now, the degree that they happen to each individual has something to do with their hereditary, so their genes. So what, what are the three things that happens? One is mood. Everybody who gets caught up in chronic mental stress, their mood is going down, and they're going to eventually get depressed and irritable to varying degrees. Their level of tension is going to go up. Everybody. Everybody who gets caught up in chronic mental stress, two, four, six, eight. I've got people, one guy yesterday was two, and he said 18 to 19 hours a day, sleeping about three to four, and 18 out of 20 hours a day. He was in, in resentment, guilt, re, you know, you name it, okay? So even three or four hours a day, mood's going down, tension level is going up, and the body is going to cry out. The body is going to start having aches either migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, sensitivity to pain at a level that most people don't, fibromyalgia. Um, they're going to, their old injury, if they have an old back injury and they get stressed, there's no way the back is going to heal. The muscles are constant pulling it. So you're going to get body pain, tension, and uh, high tension, and maybe even have panic attacks, which we don't have time today to talk about, but panic attacks are an attempt of the, of the body or mind to wake the person up to the fact that they're hurting themselves. If three minutes of upsetting thinking creates a biochemical dysregulation, four or six hours creates even more. So what's the end result? People have a, get to a high level of dis-ease, kind of a play on the word disease. When people get to a high level of dis-ease and they're feeling like crap, they go to something, what, what now the, even the DSM-5 is recognizing as externalizing disorders, which to me are solutions. They go to alcohol, they'll go to drugs, they'll go to food, and here's where heredity comes in. People will find what triggers their reward system in their amygdala, in their limbic system, they will find what their heredity has given them as the best bang for the buck. So, for instance, lady walks in, and this was the first time that she ever had compassion 
for her alcoholic parents. She had judged them harshly. She weighed three, five, 455 pounds. And as I did this little diagram that I do, she suddenly got tears in her eyes and they kind of came down her cheeks and she said, oh my God, my parents and I are just the same. Just like I shared with you that I've been spending 12 to 14 hours a day in worry, guilt, and stressful and distressful thinking, that's what my parents were doing probably. They didn't know this either. They didn't know these principles. And instead, I've used food to try to relieve that tension. They used alcohol. And she had compassion for them for the first time in her life. The judgment melted away and it made room for love made room for love. Now, some people will have a few, first time they have a drink of vodka, they'll, and they'll say, wow, I feel normal for the first time in my life. The alcohol hits that reward system. Somebody else will have a few shots of vodka the first time, and they go, God, and people like this stuff? It makes me feel terrible. I want to puke. But the first time they wrench their ankle, and somebody gives them some Vicodin, they go, oh my God, where has this been hiding? I'm home free for the first time in my life. Because the narcotics for them hit their reward system. Other people, neither of those happen, but the first time they eat, binge eat and puke, they feel a relief, or the first time they cut on themselves, or the first time they go to the gambling casino and get that adrenaline rush, each one of those people are trying to find some way to relieve their dis-ease. Now, what are, what, are, what are cravings? Cravings are people's friends, and I tell them that. If you get peace of mind, and you're not in, you will not have cravings. And then if you start having cravings, the first thing to look for is, what have you been doing with your thinking lately? because you will see that you've been thinking about something no matter how justified you think it is you've been giving attention to some thoughts that have lowered your mood and raised your level of of anxiety and of course you're going to have cravings because the brains the computer brain is going to say hey joe remember what used to help you when you got feeling this way it's still down at the corner alcohol store it's two blocks away that pint of vodka is still there waiting for you You'll feel better in no time. Or you know where you can get some cocaine? It's down at this, you know where that guy hangs out? Or you know where you can get some Vicodins or some Percocets, some Narcos? So I hope that that is it, that the answer is peace of mind. It is, and in peace of mind, nobody is addicted to anything, mm. what, no matter what your hereditary is. Now, given my heredity, if I got into thinking and stewing and fretting and worrying about things or in judgment of myself or others and Lord I would probably alcohol given my heredity would probably be something that would start to look like a good idea I hope that answers uh, uh, the question yeah That's I mean, there, the best I've got. there actually um, came through the actual question that she meant in the second comment but for some reason it wasn't showing up but I see it now and perhaps you've already answered it, but I'll read it to you and to everyone. Um, let me find it again. Do you believe that a previously sober person who now has three principles can drink moderately? In other words, that the physical allergy is not there anymore, or that the wisdom will tell them not to take the first drink at all? Yeah. There's, it, that's an interesting, and it's so loaded. It's so loaded. Um, I will tell you that there's no allergy. It, it's just the opposite, in fact. People that get addicted to alcohol, they don't have an allergy to it. They have found the thing that really turns on their reward system. <laughs> now, eventually, because of its chemistry and stuff, it, it, you can't drink enough of it to lower your anxiety because there's always a rebound where the rebound anxiety gets higher and higher and you finally get to the point where you can't drink enough to to calm without putting yourself in coma or passing out and the same thing with its it's one of the most powerful depressants there is in the world but people are attracted to it not because they're allergic to it but because it activates their reward system okay? mm -hmm. now in answer to the next qu that question 
that's really a loaded one. I, I will tell you that what happened, what I saw with my mother when I was just learning the principles, probably speaks to it. And I, I'm not telling anybody what to do. They got to be guided by their own wisdom. My mother, because of an intervention, had gotten sober, and she'd been sober for now. When they came down to move, live with us in Florida after my dad retired, she'd been sober, let's say, um, ten years. Okay, and we, we, it happened to be. Oh no, it was no, it was. And I, I got it now. It was, it was we, she'd probably been sober five or six years when my wife and I spent a, a, a year um, in, in my hometown. And, uh, in, and it was shortly after I'd learned the principles in 83. It was 1983 to 84. And it happened to be when my, uh, some of my parents' friends, who were just a few years older than them, were having their 50-year anniversaries. And we would go to them, and they'd pass out champagne or wine. And I'd notice my mom, who's been sober, she'd toast and she'd have a sip of the stuff. And I was puzzled. I, I, but I didn't. I, so we got home, and, I, and after the second, maybe the second time we'd done that, she never then kept drinking. I said, well, Mom, aren't you afraid of the alcohol? She said, not at all. She said, here's the deal, Bill. I used to drink to get a buzz, to get to feel the alcohol. Now, as soon as I start feeling it, it makes me feel worse than I'm feeling. But I used to be so stressed that when I drank, I felt a little bad. I felt better. But now, if, as soon as I start to feel the alcohol, I feel I start feeling worse than I'm feeling. So I just stop. So what I tell people is that any drug. You have to be lower than the drug to have it make to have you give you benefit. And I'll say real quick. So like if if there was four or five of us, you know, you and Max and 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 uh, my wife Linda, and we're there, and and um, if we don't have any colds, so if we the four of us had colds, then um, then if we took a cold pill. 30 minutes later, we'd all feel a little better, right? We wouldn't feel great, but we would feel better because our headache would be down and our nose would be a little clearer. And now, on the other hand, if we were all feeling really good and I came into the room, I mean, this is a bad joke, but I said, hey, I got some NyQuil, some DayQuil. I got three, four DayQuils here. I handed out the DayQuils, and we all took a DayQuil, and we're feeling good. We have no colds. 30 minutes later, what are we going to be feeling? We're going to be feeling worse than we were, right? Because we don't need the pill. We're, we're higher than the pill. Same way. If I'm stressed out and I'm a junior in college and I'm insecure, after about six beers, I used to feel a lot better. I felt smarter. I felt better looking. I felt more eloquent. Uh, uh, what was his name? I can't say. Him. He had this song called "The Silver Tongued Devil" that used to appear after his sixth beer, and he realized it was him. Right now, if I took, if I had six beers now, if I have two beers now, I'm, I'm, you know, it's the end of the evening. I'm, 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 it, because I don't need that, and it, it may, it makes me feel worse. Right, so. I guess that's all I would say. That there are there are going to be some people at a celebration or a baptism or a wedding have a little this or a little that, uh, and 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 because they no longer fear it because they're living in a, at a level of peace where that's not an issue in their life. Um, but I I would never tell people what to do or not do. They have to be guided by their wisdom. But that's the way it works. So. Well, it's um, kind of that sort of leads that last sentence into another question we got about free will and about, you know, taking advice. And um, right. if you have time, I'd like to just read you that there's two little questions and then not that little, but there's two more questions and then there's sure. some which are cool. Um, this one is, is really interesting from someone who's filling out an advanced health care directive. Mm-hmm. 
and they're wondering whether to say to cut off life support if they're in severe pain. So they don't generally 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 tolerate pain well, but there are moments when they don't notice it and they don't want to burden their family. What are your ideas on that? Well, I think I I, I, can, I hear kind of Sid's echo here that the, the last thing he would do is tell people what to do. <laughs> you know, I I would get as quiet as I could, and I would. Uh, when you were in a peaceful state of mind, I would take a look at it and see what came to mind. That's all I would say, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can't tell other people what to do about that. You know. um, that's fine. I mean, that's a tough one. Yeah, I, well, I just, it just, I, you know, again, I, I don't, I'm not very good at advice. I, like even the thing before, I, what I can do is explain to people how it works and then they're going to make whatever decision at whatever level of consciousness they're at at the time. But, but let, me, let me talk about, just a briefly, about how the feeling level is so important. Because your feeling level comes out your eyeballs. Now people say, what do you mean by that? Well, I'll exaggerate. You wake up in a low mood and you look at your spouse because you've been stewing about something and worrying and you've lowered your mood. You look at your spouse next to you and you go, what was I thinking? Okay, <laughs> you, your kids are come down to breakfast and you go, how many more years until they're 18? And you go to work where you've worked for 11 years with a great group of, group of people and you can't believe how many jerks there are that you haven't noticed before. You go home, you get a good night's rest, you realize that you're out of sorts a little bit, you wake up the next morning rested in a beautiful feeling, you look at your spouse and you have tears of gratitude to start coming down your cheeks. And you go down to breakfast and you look at your children and you, you go, well, I know it's, they're going to be gone before I know it, but I'm going to enjoy every one of these days as fully as I can. And you go to work to that same place and you say, how did I find a place to work with 11 or 12 or 15 or whatever, with such wonderful people? And they, nothing out there has changed. Nothing, Vanessa, has changed. And I'll make the point, if we, if, unless we're on a time thing, real quick. Is that okay. uh, my father, and some have heard me tell this story, my father used to have a little, I don't know if you'd call it road rage, but my mother, they were, they were Catholics, and she was always afraid in the old days of the two-lane highways on vacation, they didn't have the four-lane highways back in the 50s, that his last words were going to be, you son of a bitch! <laughs> as somebody had come into our lane, right? <laughs> you know, I, but you can erase that maybe or something. But and uh, <laughs> but he would have trouble with people that didn't drive. And so when we were down in Florida when he retired, my brother lived in Sarasota, which was a 12-mile uh, drive. But in the winter, when the population goes from 400,000 to 1.4 million, it takes 45 minutes, and they would go down to visit my brother who would take two hours off from his optometry practice and visit in the McDonald's there. And my dad, by the time he got down there, he would be shaking because of all those what I'll call SOBs on the road. And, and he would finally get about after an hour and a half, he'd be able to enjoy about 15 minutes of the visit and then the last 15 minutes he'd start anticipating driving back through those SOBs, okay? So he never really enjoyed the journey down to see my brother. And I was doing a thing on the evenings called Less Stress, More Joy for the general public, six two-hour evenings. My mom and dad had been coming to them, and they'd come to about three evenings. And so I come home this day on a Wednesday from work, and I go into the little TV room where they had a separate living room away from our kids, you know, so they could have some privacy. And I said, how are you guys? And they said, great. And my mom said, great. And I said, how was your journey to see John today? And my mother, who was a petite little lady with a sparkly blue eyes, she said, it was wonderful. We had a wonderful time today. And I noticed the we had about 30 E's on it. And I said, really? She said, and you know what? There was not one SOB on the road the entire way down or the entire back. I said, Mother, I know that road. It's full of them. It's full of them. She said, no, you ask your father. There were no SOBs on the road. 
So I go to my dad, and I can see out of the corner of his eye that he's laughing. He's hearing this conversation. He's reading the sports page. He's a big man like myself. And I said, Dad, how was your journey? And he said, Dad, he said, Bill, I never realized what a beautiful scenery there was on the way down to Sarasota. Man, is that a beautiful drive. Now, he'd been driving it for four months, but he'd never seen it before. And he said, I said, how was the, oh, he said, we had a wonderful visit. It kind of was fun. And he, I said, but what's this stuff about no SOBs? He said, well, there wasn't any. And I said, well, were there some people that tailgated you? Were there people that were going so slow it was dangerous? Were there people that sig didn't signal and cut in front of you? And, blah, blah, blah? and he says, yeah, there were a few of those. And I said, how many? He said, well, maybe 20, 25 on the way down and 20, 25 on the way back. And I said, well, Dad, I thought those were the SOPs. And he got really quiet, Vanessa, and I think it was his way of thanking me. He said, you know, today what I saw were beautiful human beings who were kind of lost in their thinking, and they weren't paying good attention to their driving. And I said a little prayer for them that they made it home safely without hurting themselves or anybody else. Wow. In the feeling level that he was now living in, when he looked at those same people where he used to see SOBs, he just saw beautiful human beings who were not paying attention as well as they could have. And that we've all done. And he, his heart went out to him. And that's what I mean by when the feeling level changes, your whole world changes. Your whole world changes. And that's why... It's good not to trust what you see when you're not in that feeling because you're seeing an illusion much more, much, much more of an illusion than you are when you're in a peaceful state of mind. This is, I mean, it's a really brilliant segue to the last question, if you don't mind. Um, no, I'm it. fine. I'm fine. Great, which is that... Um, uh, someone asked, will you please say something about psychological innocence and state of mind because it seems to me that when in a low mood, without thought recognition, there does not seem to be an apparent choice. So, yeah, I mean, was your father, you know, he was in a low psychological state. Yeah, there's not a choice. You're acting on what you see. You're making the best choice given, given what you see always. You know, my favorite story, some people have, probably heard me tell this story many times, is a, of a young man that was interviewed by Diane Sawyer on, on television. He was about 21 years old. You know, when people talk, this gives, this is an example of both psychological innocence and the fact that wisdom, mind, the universal mind is attempting to come through us every moment of our life to guide us with, with joy and lightheartedness and grace every moment of our life. Every, it's a doing its best it can to come through. But again, we can't hear a harp playing if we've got the Michigan marching band playing in our head. It's going to be hard. So this is one a story of psychological innocence and wisdom. So Diane Sawyer is interviewing this young man who's been in prison now for five years four or five years, because two months shy of his 16th birthday, he got really angry at the principal. He brought his grandfather's pistol to school, and at a point during the day, he put it in his jacket, walked down the hallway, and put five bullets in the chest of the principal and killed him. He was tried as an adult, he was found guilty, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole ever. Mm. I don't know if 50 years from now somebody, governor, could at 70, per, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, that'll have to be up to the state laws. But right now he's without parole. So he's in prison for the rest of his life for something that he did. Okay. So if people say, well, you're saying he's psychologically innocent? I say, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I have no problem with him having consequences. Although the Norwegians have an interesting different, much different way of dealing with that with um, this problem than we do but uh, that but so Diane Sawyer said what do you think about 
when you go to sleep every night? He said, well, it's the same thing every night, but I think it's probably different than you think, I think. She said, well, really, what is it? His name was Joey. He said, well, as I was walking down the hall thinking all these angry thoughts that I was using to justify taking the power of mind and using it in a personal way, which we all can because we have a free will to do that too, right? Uh, as I was doing that and walking down the hall, a whole nother set of thoughts kept trying to intrude into my mind. And Diane Sawyer was really intrigued. She said, pardon me? She said, well, there were other thoughts that kept like trying to intrude into my mind. And she said, well, like what? And she said, well, there were thoughts like, Joey, this is not a good idea. <laughs> Joey, you don't have to do this. Uh, Joey, this is not going to work out well for you. <laughs> Joey, there's the side door. Run out the side door now. Go home, take a nap, and all they'll do is get you for being leaving school early. And he said, you know, I didn't do that. I overrode those thoughts with my own personal thoughts. And I chose to go and listen to them, and I killed the principal, and now I'm paying the price. So he said, she said, so what do you think of at night? She said, every night I think of two things. Number one, I wonder where those thoughts were coming from. They were trying to help me. And number two, why didn't I have the wisdom to listen to them? Yeah. Now, Quinn, Quinn Cashin is it, and the people that are educators that are teaching this now in middle schools places, you know, those places are so blessed. Because if this young man, if Joey had had that in his fourth and fifth grade, teaching him about the principles, and how it worked, there's no way that he would have killed the principal. And no way that principal would be dead and people would have lost their father and grandfather and brother and, and husband. And there's no way that Joey would be sitting in a prison for the rest of his life. So psychologically innocent, yes. To me, there's psychological innocence. Well, there was one comment, and I think it's a great way to end it, which is that... Um, the Truth About Cancer, it's from the um, ongoing Outstanding series, The Truth About can Cancer. But um, a negative thought is more dangerous than a bad germ. Mm. And to have the wisdom and experience to know where your thinking is coming from or accept that it just is coming from some universal intelligence is, is the wisdom. Right. You know, there's a, and, and he only has part of the answer, but the, the biology of belief, I think it is, isn't it? Bruce Upton, who's a cellular um, biologist, he, he, he sees the role of thought. He doesn't see the principles, but he says every moment of our life, we are either bathing our, whatever it is, 150 trillion cells or 100 billion cells, with nutrients of, of love and compassion or with the poison of anger, judgment, or and it's affecting... The, every single cell in the body, moment to moment, or neutral. We'd see people say, "What? What's? What time is it?" That's neutral, right? But we're, boy, when you start thinking of it that way, <laughs> that I say, you know, do you think this is important to learn? <laughs> you know, and the and the thing I say, especially to parents, and I say, you know, listen, please be gentle on yourselves. You you've done the best you've known how to do, and. If you come into the light out of the darkness, if you have an insight, it's so easy of, of us to turn on ourselves and beat ourselves up for the things we broke and knocked over in the darkness. And the, the healthier choice is to be grateful that you now have light. Because if you start beating yourself up for what you broke and knocked over in the darkness, believe me, the dimmer is going to start coming down. The lights are going to start coming down. And you're going to end up back in the darkness. Hmm. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. You're so welcome.
Please say hi to Max for me. I will, and, and thank you to everyone who's stayed on a bit longer than we usually do and, and listened to um, Dr. William Pettit, who was giving us this wonderful webinar. And join us next month. It was fun. Thank, thank you. you.